Thanks very much for joining us for episode 19 of InTech Freight and Logistics, the podcast. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my co-host for this edition, InTech President Shelly Austin. On this episode, we're talking shipping to and from Mexico. Let's get started. While many corners of the freight market have been sluggish for the past year plus, that generally hasn't been the case when it comes to cross-border shipping between the U.S. and Mexico. To take us through what's happening, what to expect, and how to thrive among these transportation lanes, we welcome a guest with plenty of experience in this area, Eduardo Morales, Managing Director of Tenon Solutions. Eduardo, thanks very much for joining us today. Hello, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Great. So uh, first off, just uh, tell us a little bit, uh, kind of a broad overview of of what you do. Absolutely. So in Tenon Solutions, we are a 3PL company based in Saltillo, Monterrey, and Laredo, Texas. And we provide custom transportation and warehousing services between Mexico, U.S., and Canada. So what's a typical day like for you? If there is one. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> as in logistics, you know, everything changes by the minute. So we usually serve customers that are, are focused on the cross-border market. You know, most of our customers are based in Monterrey and Saltillo and go through the Laredo port all the way to the north of the U.S. We serve different customers that go in a range of products from automotive to finished goods. So Eduardo, um, to bring to our listeners today, Intech and and yourself and Tenen and everybody, we, we've worked together for a while and it's ex- exciting. So I think, we, you know, if you can tell the listeners kind of how we've partnered up and, and there's different solutions. So for us as Intech, we don't have that expertise that you bring in, in servicing the Mexico market. So as a joint solution, we're able to help with some of the intermodal, help with some of the U.S. operations and, and, and put those two things together to where we can offer all the customers that expertise in that cross-border shipping. So if, if you could just kind of bring about kind of how that partnership works and, and what different things we can do to offer to the customers, maybe if they're having some concerns or, you know, hesitations of, of looking at doing Mexico operations, how what we've put together can kind of put that at ease for them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, coming into Mexico is always a, an adventure. So having a partner here that knows the custom side of the, of, the, of the business, the transportation opportunities, and having local providers always make things easier. So the advantage that we see in having a partner that is in both sides of the border is that we understand and we have gone through all the challenges several times in setting up new operations or changing operations that are already running. So we believe that we do add value by having a partner also on the other side, such as yourself, who has, you know, who speaks the same language logistics wise, Mm -hmm. you know, on the other side of the, because sometimes we assume a lot of things in, in Mexico that are not true for you. So being able to match those necessities and being able to have the input, you know, from both sides has helped us to build and to avoid, you know, some of the most common issues that come up with going across the border back and forth. Now, you bring up a very good point. I mean, and likewise on our side, you know, on the U.S. side of things, we assume a lot of things that in Mexico that, you know, we don't understand. So that partnership brings a lot to the table. And I think it's exciting and it's going to continue to be more and more exciting. What are you seeing? You know, Kevin started out and I think he brought up a very good point. You know, for for us, we saw kind of a sluggish first of the year. Um, you know, we all had that crazy, hey, you know, crazy market during the pandemic. And then all of a sudden it kind of hit a wall and, you know, the demand went down We're, in our perspective. But I think it's not so much that way in Mexico, right? So with everything kind of shifting in, in the manufacturing, the nearshoring and everything, what do you see in Mexico right now as far as the, the market? Is it really strong? And, and tell us a little bit about what you're seeing. Well, these are um, challenging times right now in the, in the freight market in Mexico. You know, the super peso is really, you know, having an impact in the trucking companies in Mexico because right now 
we are around 50%, uh, getting 15% less revenue on the trucking side because last year peso was around 20 pesos per dollar and right now it's around 17. So that has taken a, a, a toll on the rates and rates have not been moving. It's very difficult for rates. Rates in Mexico are not so dynamic. They are more still, you know, it's uh, harder to make those increases and decreases of rates. So it is right now a, a kind of challenging for all the trucking companies. So also with the, with the slowdown in the U.S., th th there is also an impact in Mexico. As in the U.S., capacity grew the last two years. You know, a lot of people acquire uh, trailers and make commitments into trucks. And it is getting a little harder for them to get the kilometers per week needed. So it is also uh, a slow market right now in Mexico. The, the near shoring, you know, all the bus around near shoring, is yet to be seen in transportation and logistics. Right now, the main impact that nearshoring is having has to do with industrial park development and building up to that. We believe, and what I have been reading, is that we might see the benefits of it maybe by 2025 in the transportation and logistics side. Right now, we are getting, you know, all the buildings, the energy set up, you know, the personnel. So we still have a long way to go, you know, for the transportation to, and I'm talking about cross border, you know, going up and up and down to the U.S. and Canada. We do see an increase of material flowing from China into Mexico because a lot of the relocalization has to do with China coming into Mexico, not only U.S. companies coming back to North America, but also Chinese companies building up their operations here to get a uh, faster and to get uh, easier access. And, you know, right now with all the geopolitics going on, they want to be based in Mexico so they can avoid whatever comes next. <laughs> so that's what, yeah, that's what we're seeing. Wow. Is there a specific commodity or a specific area that you see growing more in Mexico as far as I know autos has, auto parts has always been big, but uh, tell us kind of what you see commodity-wise. Yeah, well, there is a very wide range of things that are setting up. You can see from turf, you know, plastic turf companies setting up big operations, a lot of furniture, a lot of uh, office equipment. There is some automotive, but what we have seen is that most of the Increase in auto Chinese brands coming into Mexico have to do with the finished product brought into Mexico and coming into the market, you know, to go into Latin America and Mexican market, the cars, the finished goods. Auto parts from China, there is, but it's not like as strong as the companies that make home appliances. Yeah, basically, that's what you can see growing, you know, finished goods going into the U.S., home appliances, turf, office equipment. Yeah, mostly so, that. So not so much manufacturing in the, that regard, more of a distribution model kind of thing. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, going both directions, people have maybe some misconceptions about what's needed to ship cross-border, what the attitudes are, kind of how to play the game. But uh, is, is there anything in particular that you've seen from american companies that's that's sort of a, the most common kind of misconception or something that they routinely do wrong and, and things that that you've been able to address yes well sometimes when we're setting up new operations being that some machinery is being moved from their facilities in the u.s and into mexico we have to go through a list you know to a packing list and it seems sometimes the feedback that we get when we try to be very specific with customers that everything that goes into the trailer has to be in the packing list, even if that is a single cable. <laughs> I believe that having the right partner in Mexico that to tell you this and to, and to be able to have the, the time and the knowledge to share that with the U.S. shippers that want to come into Mexico is very important because those little things are the most frequent mistakes we see when coming into Mexico. 
because you just, you know, oh, I forgot maybe <laughs> this, this box and you put it and, and some, someone before closing the doors, just put it in there. And that becomes a real risk when going across the border. So those kind of things, those kinds of not important issues are the ones <laughs> that minor. most frequent. Yeah, those, those are the ones that most of the time stop the merchandise and generate, you know, delays and troubles when going across the border. So, you know, you have all the big heavy classification and, you know, all the code compliance and all of that, you know, that is heavy duty work, but that is, that is mostly understood that has to be approached, you know, and attended. But those of the vision things, such as small things like this, like, like just throwing a, a box into the trailer, those sometimes are the things that we have to put a lot of emphasis with the shippers that they, they have to stick to the script. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of delays does something, something like that, one of these minor little things, what kind of a delay or, or issue can that really cause? Yeah, well, if you get a, a red light when going across the border, that can translate in maybe a couple of days of your uh, cargo being stopped, you know, at the bridge or maybe a, a penalty, you know, a U.S. dollars penalty because of that. And if the product is uh, valuable or it has a special classification because it's an, an a special metal or something like that, it can become a little a little more serious than that. So that is why it's important, you know, to have that very open communication between the two parties. So whenever something is going across the border, everything is, is you know, checked. So Eduardo, I, th I find it interesting in the trucking, I don't think everybody realizes that there's two ways of trucking for, for Mexico to U.S. And, and, and alternately the other way, U.S. to Mexico. And I think that involves translating, right? And I'm interested in how much that has changed. So in the past, a lot of times the U.S. truckers wouldn't bring their equipment into Mexico. So you would need to transload to do that final mile or vice versa. The same with Mexico. A lot of times we've quoted business where we'll take it to a certain point, transload it, and then load it onto a U.S. truck and make the final delivery. How much are you seeing that type of transloading activity versus the direct move these days for, for trucking in, in from cross-border? We'll see transloading coming back, you know. Right now, efficiency at the border has become an issue for U.S. trucking companies. So they rather stop, you know, at the border on the U.S. side with their trucks to get live loaded and then just go back to the north to their, to their more efficient lanes. And some shippers, especially the ones that handle uh, big volumes, they are again approaching the transloading and the distribution center from Laredo, because they have found that there is an opportunity also. Right now, there are a lot of companies that have grown in the last year, Mexican companies, you know, local, especially in the north, talking about Saltillo, Monterrey, Querétaro, San Luis, those are in Bajio. So they can offer very good equipment, very uh, high level service also. and very competitive rates, you know, so U.S. companies have found out that it is very expensive to go all the way into Mexico because you might miss two days at the border in the U.S. side plus two days in the Mexico side, you know, at the border plus whatever days you need to get unloaded and then loaded again. So when they compare what a lane between, I don't know, maybe Dallas and Chicago, how many trucks they need to do that trip, how many trailers they need to do that trip. The map just doesn't add up. And those are the big, you know, the big trucking companies that, that have the, the volume of trailers, you know, to, to be able to get five or 10 loads covered, nor bound for a customer. And because of that, we are seeing a lot of big IMCs going into the Bajio market and offering the intermodal service right now that goes, you know, all the way from the Puerta Mexico in Toluca and San Luis Potosí, you know, 
And because those days in intermodal apparently are less costly for them, I guess. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think that, like you mentioned, there was a time there where it wasn't, the intermodal was was not as, as cost effective. But when you look at the, the cost of, like you mentioned, you, you have to handle it a few different times on the truck to make it efficient. Some of the intermodal is now coming back to play in quite strong on the cross-border market. So I think, you know, it, it's, I think it's going to continue to add value. And it's interesting because there's steel wheel, we call it steel wheel and rubber tire options, right, on the intermodal. So very similar to, to what you were talking about, Edward, on the truck side, it's somewhat similar on the intermodal side where, you know, we like to look for those steel wheel options where you're not stopping at the border and you're continuing on in. But just as you mentioned on the truckload side, sometimes people get very shocked that it can be cheaper to do the rubber tire solution because of that trucking cost of taking all the way into Mexico versus, you know, crossing the border and then picking it up with a, a different carrier on the once it's crossed the border. So I think it, it's interesting. And it's not just that, you know, initially, you wouldn't think that that would be cheaper to touch it multiple times versus taking it directly in. But on the truckload side and the intermodal side, we've seen that to be the case many times. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have seen a lot of more intermodal equipment coming into Mexico year over year. Is increasingly, I believe also that the IMCs have been doing a very good work educating the shippers about that there is no black or white. You know, there is a, you, you don't have to go one side or the other. You need to have the two options available and set up and running because disruptions do come, you know, security wise in, in Mexico or maybe at the bridge or maybe capacity wise or maybe right now with all the extreme weather, you know, events happening, maybe you do have to get uh, an intermodal solution to get to your destination because right now you don't have the capacity, you know, the truckload capacity available. So we do see more customer asking for, for that solution. And I guess it is a very good opportunity right now. There is investment. There is a lot of investment going on in Mexico in several railroad ramps. So that also helps, you know, availability of uh, chassis in Mexico also increased. So it's becoming a good mix right now for shippers. Fantastic. Another thing that we actually had someone on from CPKC a, a few podcast episodes ago. And one thing she was pointing out was the crossing the border process. There's obviously hours of operation on the truck side at the road crossings. She mentioned that there's a lot more open time, really, in terms of trains crossing the border and a little bit of an easier process there. Is that something that you've seen as well? Yes. And I believe they are also building a second rail track going across uh, Laredo to Nuevo Laredo. So that is supposed to increase capacity, increase uh, volume a lot. Yes. So we've talked about the border crossing being an issue, but it really comes down to obviously customs is a big part of it as well. So how do people start to approach the the customs process in addition to, you know, what, what you mentioned with the packing slips? What are some other things that, that people have to think about with that? Well, definitely you need to, to have a partner. You, you need to have a, a good service provider to take you through all the process. You know, there is definitely something that needs time. It's not a matter of being easy or difficult. You know, it is just something that there are a lot of companies, including us, that have expertise on that and that can take you through the whole process. And I think that that is the main, the main thing that a that shipper in the U.S. That, that wants to come to Mexico or that wants to import from Mexico has to take into account. Going solo on this is a it's a no a no no. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so there is a lot of great partners that you know exist right now in the market. We believe that we do provide value. You know, we we believe that we can tell you the reality. You know of the challenges that has to be met. You know in order to do this, and once it's set up, most of the time things go back and forth very easily, but they have to be set up really well from the beginning. So we can, you know, just go kind of automatic after that. 
Well, I would think also, I mean, first of all, you help prepare the the shipper to know not to throw the box in and without putting it on the list. But also, if they do make the mistake in some way, shape or form, it also really pays to have somebody there who can kind of shepherd through the process at that point as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because mistakes do happen, you know, maybe a typo or maybe an omission or maybe a missed email because those things happen a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, everything has a solution and we do know the channels to take our customers through through that solution and make it as, as expedited as possible. So the product arrives at its destination, you know, as, as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So Eduardo, I think it's important for everybody to know, cause you've mentioned on it and touched on it, but I think as we're talking about this, so you, you guys are a one-stop shop, right? I mean, that's, what's so neat about this. Cause if you think about any cross-border shipping, you know, a lot of shippers have to have, they have to have their, their brokerage arm, and then they have to have their trucking arm, and then they have to have their warehousing arm. And and when you get so many different people involved, that's gonna that could cause delays and that could cause confusion in the whole logistics process. But what is so important to highlight here is that you do all of that, right? So it's not like they need to to go find a, a broker that a customs broker that can help them, and then they need to go find their trucker that can help them, and then they need to go find the warehouse. You can bring that solution to light for them and have that one point of contact that can help them all the way through the, you know, from the beginning to the end. And I think that's very, very important, to not only in efficiency, but effectiveness in, in doing the cross-border shipping. Yeah, we have been working very hard, you know, to try to make, a, as you say, a one point of contact, even if one person, you know, because customs has, it's, you must have a certain amount of knowledge about it. But we try to make it so that one person attends one account and he can, you know, tell you how everything is in all the process of the transit of your goods. So we do have the brokerage side, the transportation brokerage. We also run our own warehouses. We have presence in Querétaro, in Monterrey, in Saltillo, and in Laredo, Texas. So that gives us, you know, the advantage of being able to react really quickly in an event of something being needed, you know, maybe one part number from a shipment needs to get pulled out and sent for an, in an expedited service. So we can do that if we manage everything because we, we know that all, all the involved parts. So yeah, we work, you know, as a single service also, because we understand that customers sometimes have their own special operations and their own needs. We can do that also, but we believe that we can provide a lot of value and a good experience, you know, by taking the whole project, you know, taking the whole operation. Yeah. So before we go, any particular areas that you see a real, a great opportunity for somebody who's listening right now to, to get started, whether it's a you know type of good or a lane or anything like that? Is there, is there something in particular that you're really excited about filling up some more, more space there? Yeah, well... Here in Mexico, you hear a lot of optimism on what's going on right now. You know, we see a lot of companies approaching again, you know, coming into Mexico, being those maybe Chinese companies or U.S. companies opening up more facilities. There is a big buzz right now going on in Monterrey with the Tesla coming in. And you can see buildings going up around that project. So I, I believe that Mexico do has its challenges right now, you know, but we are all working in order to be able to be that value provider for all those looking to come into Mexico. So you can really find that people are more prepared right now, you know, to receive that investment and to create value for the market and to try to be more integrated, you know, logistic wise, you know, so there are big efforts into streamlining the customs processes between the U.S. and Mexico. There is a big movement right now from the custom brokers in Mexico trying to get rid of so many processes in order to export. So, so yeah, we are, we are excited. We are, we are really in Mexico right now, growing challenges in the trucking side. I can tell you that 
there is a driver shortage since I started in the trucking business in 2010. And since 2010, we have been having a, a driver's shortage. So that still is an issue. But you can see things happening now, more schools coming up for drivers, something that didn't happen, you know, 12, 13 years ago. So yeah, I believe that this is something that is going to be very beneficial for all of us involved in logistics. I do see a big opportunity also in the intermodal business between Mexico and the US. There is a big investment. There is more opening up right now from the intermodal companies. Before it was kind of, a, it was more close for us in Mexico, but right now you see approaching them and giving you a chance to offer the service as a triple company, something that is new for us. So it is good. Yeah, it, it looks good ahead. Excellent. We like to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a best way for somebody to get in touch with you if they were interested in learning more? Yeah, sure. You can send me an email at eduardo at com, and I hope I can help you. All right. Thanks very much for taking the time, Eduardo. Thanks, really Eduardo. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for InTech Freight and Logistics, the podcast. And thanks very much to Eduardo Morales for taking the time to speak with us. Check out the links in the description to learn more about everything we discussed. Subscribe or follow now to ensure you get our latest episodes as soon as they're available. And you can help us out by rating and reviewing us wherever you listen. If you have questions, email us at podcast at intechlogistics.com and visit intechfreight-logistics.com for more about what we do. For Shelley Austin, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll talk to you next time.